warm welcome to Mr. Manoj Singh, the speaker for the fourth session of the XLRI Leadership Series. Mr. Manoj Singh is the COO of Deloitte Tush Tumatsu Limited. He is one of the four global managing directors reporting to the global CEO. Mr. Manoj has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur and an MBA from Carnegie Mellon University. Sir, it's an honor to have you here with us. I request uh, Vibha to present a bouquet as a token of appreciation. Please welcome Mr. Manoj Singh, Sir the Nice. Thanks a lot and good afternoon and thanks for uh, being so well dressed, looking sharp and taking the time to come here and listen to me. I hope your time is worthwhile when we get done. Uh, so I'm really delighted to be here and uh, among uh, other things about my introduction, I should thank uh, Mr. Singh who is here. He's like an elder brother to me and my younger brother is here as well. He works for Tara Steel. But I have a lot of uh, deep connections with this city. I, uh, I first moved here uh, when I was four years old. My father used to work for Tinflate. Uh, and then this was in the mid-50s. And then uh, when I was enrolled at IIT Kanpur, uh, he, he came back again when we started for several years. And I used to come here during my winter and summer break. So this is a city that where my connection goes back at least 50 years. And I'm really delighted to be here. I've spoken here at least once that I can remember. And it's always uh, nice to be here among young and bright people like each of you. Uh, what I wanted to do uh, today is that I just asked uh, the students before is I want to make this as interactive as possible so it's meaningful for you because I don't want to talk about things that are interesting to me and they may not be interesting to you. <coughs> but the presentation I have is something that I have used uh, at other campuses. I have a lot of personal interest in uh, staying connected with students. You know, we Deloitte hire a lot of people around the world every year. We have about 200,000 professionals in over 100 countries. <clears throat> so every year, <clears throat> I would say, if you just take normal admission into account, <clears throat> we are probably bringing in about 25 to 30,000 people all over the world. So I enjoy doing this, and uh, it's a good way of staying connected with younger people. So the presentation that I have, the, the precise content of it, uh, may, or may, may not uh, connect equally with each of you. But hopefully, uh, you'll appreciate the spirit of it, and uh, whatever uh, you think of it, I hope you can engage in some questions when I'm done, and I'll be around after this is over as well. But what I wanted to talk about principally was uh, the, the, the theme of this essentially is about uh, the, the impact of disruptive innovation in, in people's life. And my profession journey is almost over. Yours is, I understand most of you have been in the, in the workplace for about five to ten years or so. So you have a lot of runway ahead of you. And regardless of whether you're here in India or somewhere else around the world, uh, technology and its disruptive impact is going to have it's going to have a tremendous role to play in what you do. So that's the theme of this, and it applies uh, at varying degrees for different people. But uh, you'll be the judge. So just a little bit first about what's happening around the world. Uh, in my job, since we have a relatively global footprint, I'm actually traveling a lot. Uh, internationally. I am probably on a plane two to three weeks a month, and most of it is global travel. So that's the bad news, which is the travel. The good news is that you really have a pulse of what's happening around the world. And in many ways, uh, we experience, we as a firm experience uh, the impact of the economy. And the global economy, which I'm sure most of you follow, it has been a bit of a whitewater trip in the sense that the moment you think things are getting better, you suddenly have problems in certain parts of the world, whether it's political, whether it's economic, whatever it is, and it ripples all the way through. So it's a very interconnected world. But having said all that, I guess I'll say two things. Uh, you see some uh, verbiage there of different countries and what's happening. But uh, what I would say is that today, if you, if you had asked me this question in 2009, when uh, particularly the West and particularly the US was in the depth of a global recession, uh, I would not necessarily have said that today, but relatively speaking, the U.S. economy is doing far better than most of the economies around the world. That doesn't mean it's great, 
That doesn't mean that you know if you're a 22 year old graduating from a university that is not of high repute or someone who's over 50 and you lost your job. It's one of the hardest times even there to find a job. But having put all that together, you look at the level of unemployment, you look at price of housing, you look at interest rates, uh, you look at the opportunities around innovation, all that. The US economy is actually doing very, very well. And the other place which has a lot of promise and is doing well is the Indian economy. And, 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 and I would say that the, the, the key thing here, so all of you uh, are going to graduate during a period of tremendous excitement, tremendous opportunity, and in many ways you have a chance to shape the future of this country. But the thing that is important, and I'm not talking about India, is it has to be basically moving ahead, looking through the windshield, not through the rear view mirror in the sense that the execution is very important, implementation is very, very important. And, and, and just, to, just to finish the story on the, on, the, on the macroeconomic environment, actually Europe is experiencing the hardest time right now. And other than Germany, Germany as a nation is very, very efficient right now. It's very well poised to be ready for export, except everyone else in Europe is sort of sick. And China, which was uh, one of the biggest importers for a long time, certainly for the last decade, on a relative basis has slowed down. China as a country is still growing faster than most other countries. And if you put that on the base of China, it's still growing very well. But China also has uh, an incredible number of challenges right now, and they can be pretty significant. The thing is, the, you know, the good news is very big. It's a very developed economy. It's got tremendous infrastructure. But when you become big, when you become famous, you inherit some new problems. And today, China, it's things like pollution. You know, as people get richer and they look around, and the environment is not as good as they would like it to be, they complain a lot more than they did 10 years ago. And the cost of fixing some of the pollution is immense. Even in, even in, the, in, the, in the highly uh, developed areas around Shanghai, around Beijing, and places like that. So uh, the environment is a big challenge that China faces. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time. Uh, the second thing is that uh, as China has been a big exporter as well, and a lot of the factories around the um, uh, around the coast, as you go from north to south, uh, a lot of them are sitting idle. So what happens is, you know, the thing that drove China's GDP seven, eight, nine percent, etc., is very heavy migration from from the rural areas to the urban areas. And when export slows down, that that migration slows down, your economy slows down, and when the economy slows down, a lot of people basically don't have a job. If you don't have a job, uh, you don't you can't afford to live in a place like uh, uh, Shanghai and Beijing or. Uh, or Nanjing or Tianjin or whatever the places are, and it becomes very difficult. So China has got some unique challenges with employment, with uh, pollution, with banks actually who are not very well capitalized. So the point of all of that is, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that China is still going to do very well, but it's a very unique opportunity for India right now. And I think that that's, that's the primary message around this. So, you know, I think I covered some of this, but if you look at it, tremendous opportunities here. Uh, I'm going to talk about innovation in a moment, and I'm going to talk about that in the context of the U.S. and how, how it applies to India as well. But in India, at least, you know a lot more about India than I do. I've lived in the U.S. for the last 40 years. I, I visit India regularly three or four times a year. But I, I don't, I don't uh, experience the economy every day as you do. But I would say that the biggest opportunities here certainly continue to be with, in the area of technology, but also life sciences, uh, you know, the pharma, Healthcare is a big area. This whole area, thing around cybersecurity in a connected world is a very, very big uh, emerging industry. Uh, big data, data analytics, all of those are big opportunities uh, that, that basically uh, are, are in front of you. And it's not, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about technology, but it's not technology for technologists. It's technology as a general business person, no matter where you are. And I think that that's the, that's the, that's the most important message. So, we as a firm, Deloitte, uh, have started spending a lot of time uh, talking about innovation and the impact of disruptive innovation. You know, we have $35 billion, as I said, in 100 plus countries. And you look at businesses around the world and how established businesses, how they have been disrupted. Kodak, you know, Kodak was the leading figure, uh, certainly during my times and perhaps during your times as well, if you ever owned a camera, basically, Kodak film, right? And who would have predicted today that Kodak 
where we have to file for bankruptcy and is essentially facing extinction in many ways. They have the technology in digital photography that just didn't uh, execute it well. And there are many other examples like that. You know, look at Blockbuster, you look at Barnes and Noble, uh, and some of the impact of Amazon and other companies. So, disruptive innovation has a, has a big impact. There's an organization in the U.S. called uh, Singularity University. It's not a university like XLI here, but that's, that's what they name themselves. It's essentially an innovation think tank. It's located in Silicon Valley. And, and uh, they have people who work in industry and they collect a lot of information. And they have developed points of view and they go around and talk to senior executives around the world. One of the things uh, that, that stays with me, uh, which I heard about a year ago, uh, is that and this to you, all of you, uh, you know, young graduates, uh, it represents opportunity, it represents challenge as well. Um, so, so here's the thing. They would say that the average life of a profession is going to be about five years. That doesn't mean every profession is going to get disrupted in five years, but by and large, the professions that you all are going to get engaged in or you're going to deal with, or your clients deal with, it gets, it, it'll change it every five years. It doesn't mean it'll change completely, but it'll change enough that you have to be two years. So that's the first data point. The second data point is that as economies around the world get better, uh, which they are, the, there won't be a proportionate growth in jobs. And, and the reason for that is automation and technology. So if you think about it, in the last six years, economies around the world rebounding. If you actually look at it, the job growth is not proportionate to how economies are rebounding. And, and so fewer jobs in proportion to the growth in the economy. The, uh, the first point that I made earlier about uh, basically profession getting disrupted in five years. And then the last point, uh, which is the picture on the right, is that people are going to live a lot longer. Healthcare is better everywhere around the world, better in certain places than in others. But relatively, you know, the average lifespan has increased dramatically. But more important, the impact of 3D printing, uh, it is expected that in the next few years, you know how people have to wait for transplants, whether it's a kidney transplant, liver transplant, or whatever it is. Uh, for, a, for a donor, it is expected that 3D printing will produce biological quality uh, organs, which you don't, essentially don't have to wait. Okay, so so it just makes living longer a lot easier because healthcare is much more accessible in that regard. So you put all those three things together, not enough jobs, your profession gets uh, disrupted, you live longer, and you can look at the glass as half empty or you look at the glass as half full in terms of the opportunity. So what it says is you have to be always on your toes in terms of, you know, retooling yourself, understanding where you're working, what is the impact of disruption in an organization that you belong today that you will go back to when you're done or whatever it is. I think that that's the point of this, and I think that that's going to be the case. And, and you know, the impact of technology, you can say that, yeah, okay, that sounds very esoteric and Silicon Valley is not the rest of the world, but what is happening today, as you know very well, is that technology is pervasive. And its impact is felt anyway. People are better informed, they're better educated, they have access to stuff. So no matter where you are in the world, you are a lot better informed about stuff and your aspirations are different. And you're going to be affected by it. So, so the point is, as I've said, you know, how much have you really been thinking about innovation enabled by technology? Because it's going to be a very key part of what you do. You, you know, you read about uh, people who have uh, changed the world. This is the phone I have, it's an iPhone, I'm sure many of you have that. Think about Steve Jobs and his life. Uh, I would say that each of you have an opportunity to have an impact, to change the world. Change the world broadly defined, and change the world defined in a slightly more restrictive way. And I think that that's the aspiration that you have to have. Because the impact that any single individual can have today it's just immense. It's much, much easier today to be successful with a product or an idea than it was five years ago or ten years ago, without a doubt. My son-in-law and two daughters, a younger son-in-law, graduated from Harvard Business School four years ago. One of his classmates has basically introduced, uh, launched a firm which does something very simple. And I'll just explain to you, it's essentially you know, if you are a working person or a working couple and you don't have the time or you don't want to spend the time basically going out there shopping 
buying the right stuff, bringing it home, putting it in a fridge, you know, chopping stuff and things like that. He's essentially created an organization which, uh, what they do is, they send a menu. If you belong to it, it's a subscriber. They send a menu. So a week in advance, you know that what are the meals that they are offering over the next five days. And these are basically meals that are designed uh, by chefs if, uh, who are pretty well known. And they essentially, you pick the meal and they ship you the ingredients, the raw ingredients, ice packed, but the exact quantities are there. The food is not made, it's not cooked, the directions are there. But you know, you don't have to buy this, this many chilies if you're only going to use two. So it's all packed to what you, what you need. And essentially you come home and within half an hour, you can cook a meal for two. A pretty delicious meal, a whole meal. Anyway, so that's the background. Two years ago, his company is worth, was valued just three weeks ago for half a billion dollars. And what is it basically is a warehouse, getting stuff, getting a chef to essentially write the menu, looking forward, getting more and more clients. He started with a warehouse in New York, he opened one in New Jersey, now there's one in Texas, he's opened one on the West Coast. And so I'm just giving that as an opportunity to what you get. It's not about making money, that's not my point. Certainly that's a good outcome. But you think about the impact, I forget the exact number, they're shipping something like 2 million meals a month, 24 million meals a year. Think about the reach that that brand has among working people. And a lot of it is actually enabled by technology, if you really think about it. It's a supply chain game, also with some, with some very nifty market. So those are the ideas, very hard to execute uh, some years ago. So, these are some of the things, I'm sure you know a lot about it, and my intent is not to go through each one of these, but this is what is going to be embracing your life, regardless of whether you are in technology or not. And, and, and being conversant with it, understanding its impact, and being able to understand exactly how it's going to impact your life, I think is very, very important. That's all I wanted to say. So what does it mean? It basically, you know, be conversant, adapt, leverage, analytical style and everything, all of those are very, very key. Data is immense today, and I'm going to give you four examples of things where the amount of information that's being generated today, and I'm sure you've seen this, you know, every three days you're generating as much information that probably was generated from the dawn of civilization to up to 10 years ago. And the question is, how do you use that information? And the people who are able to use that information in an effective way, and, 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 and utilize it to differentiate themselves and have an impact on the ones who are going to be successful. So let me just uh, give you four examples. There are many others. You may know about some of them. About how essentially information and data is being used, analytics is being used, innovation is coming into play to be able to impact uh, things. So the airlines. The airlines collect a lot of information, as you know. You know, if you get into a sophisticated 777, Airbus 380, the avionics on this are very, very complicated. There's an immense amount of information that's been uh, collected. So, American Airlines uh, has done this thing, which basically, so you have planes flying north-south from New York to South Paulo, Brazil, from New York to London, going east-west, some over the water, some primarily over land, some using Rolls-Royce engines, some using GE engines, some using Pratt & Whitney engines. And, and all this information is collected on how the engines are performing under different environments, different altitudes, different speeds, different temperatures, over water, over land. And, and, and you can basically, they have been able to use this information to be able to predict engine failure, which again, helps manage maintenance costs. So not only it helps with human lives and, and addressing accidents that occur, but you are able to basically you know, essentially schedule maintenance such that you don't have downtime in airplanes. And the impact of this is, is enormous. It's saved maintenance costs more than 25-30%. Air travel in the US, the airline business is very, very competitive. It's very hard to make money. And, and, uh, and, and because of that, unless you're on a very tight ship in terms of high loads, low maintenance costs and things like that, it's very, very difficult. This is Nothing very revolutionary, but it's all about taking information and being able to manage it in a way that's just exceptional. How many of you have heard of Uber, the taxi service? Do they have Uber in India? Yes. They do. In the big cities only, or even here? Okay. So, 
So what is the valuation of Uber? How much? Yeah, about $20 billion. And what, what access do you think they have? It's probably a very sophisticated program that helps connect drivers to passengers. That's all there is to it. There's no over They probably don't even have as many buildings as you do over here in XLF. And, and this company started, I think, about five or six years ago. Yeah, maybe a little more. It's just growing. Now, now they've had some other problems. Some of their executives have been quite nasty and they're making bad statements and things like that. That's a different issue. But the point is, so here's, uh, here's, here's my point about this. It's, it, it's, it's all about, essentially, you, you think about, so in New York, when the immigrants go to New York City, and you don't have a degree, you have some relatives that help you get a green card, and you arrive there, it's an expensive city, it's an expensive country, and you have to work, there's no other alternative. One of the easiest things to do is become a taxi driver. And that's been the case for, I lived in the US for the last 40 years, probably been the case even longer. And to get a taxi in New York, you have to pay anywhere from 10 to $15,000, uh, perhaps even more, to get what they call the, uh, you know, the emblem, the taxi, uh, the license, essentially, to operate one car. And you pay a lot of money, essentially, to rent the car during the day. You know, people rent it from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. The next shift starts from 4 uh, p.m. beyond. And, uh, and essentially, you make as much money as you can picking up drivers. That whole business in New York, I'm just using New York as an example, it's not the only one, is getting totally disrupted. Who would have predicted that a taxi cab business, which is the safest thing, I mean, people always need taxis to get from one place to another. No one is interested because a New York taxi is 30 and not at nine. When you need it at five o'clock, chances are there's a shift change, and every third taxi essentially is available, but they're on a shift change and no more to go. Every first and second taxi is full. And so Uber is just cleaning up the market. And, and they're getting better at it every day because they understand what your needs are. Their drivers, essentially, are required to be friendly, clean, keep their cars clean, uh, be able to speak wherever you are, in this case English. And they are actually just cleaning up the market. And it's all about simple software that you can essentially have on your phone here, and it just tracks you, and and, uh, and, and you know before you know you're sitting in a cab. I was in Hong Kong four weeks ago. I don't use it much. I'm not good at. I'm talking about technology, but I'm personally not as good at technology as I sound. So one of my children put one of those Uber apps on my phone, and I was waiting for a taxi. I was getting late for dinner. Hong Kong has one of the best taxi services. It's not very expensive. They're relatively clean, but the worst time is at 7 p.m. I think it was a Thursday night or something, I was waiting in a cab line and I knew I was going to be late for dinner. So I said, I'm going to try this. I've never tried it um, outside the U.S. And within, within literally two minutes, I got the name, the registration number of the car, and a picture of the driver. So for me, the hardest thing was the car pulling in because I had to look at the registration to figure out what the car was. And it was perfect. I got there on time. It's one of the so they are in now, I believe, something like 45 cities around the world, 18 billion. And I believe that if they do it right and they grow properly, there's a lot of competition. The, the market cap will be a couple of times what it is today. Five people sitting in a room, devising software, using the cloud, using mobile devices essentially to do that. Oops. Okay. It's uh, another example. It's a business you don't want to talk about, but Sloan Catering Center. In New York is one of the most famous uh, cancer research uh, facilities in the U.S., uh, maybe in the world. And doctors there are essentially using this uh, facility, uh, the, the, the information that they get, looking at patients, the age of the patient, cultural background, uh, whatever the cancer is, how advanced it is, etc. They basically plan their treatment around them. And there is statistical analysis that's been done which basically enables you to tailor the treatment to the individual. It helps the patient, it helps with recovery rates, it helps with the reputation of the hospital. So it's an amazing thing. The last one. Uh, you know, the uh, London Olympics two years ago, uh, Nike was, uh, Adidas was the official sponsor uh, for the, for the uh, London Games. Nike bid on it, they lost. And they're not happy about it, obviously. I think that's paid a lot of money. I'm not even sure what it is, but it was well over $100 million or so. So one of the things that Nike did was that it essentially started a program called uh, 
you know, find your greatness. And they picked, believe it or not, there are eight or nine locations around the world that are also called London. There are two in the US, there's one in Greece, all of them. And, and they essentially picked these locations and they had amateur athletes essentially uh, engage in whatever it is, you know, run a five kilometer thing or a big athlete or whatever it is. They timed themselves and they had a little competition in that particular location, whatever it was. And they basically used the web to publish these results and they got a lot of competition going and a lot of interest. Using social media, there were over 10 million people who got involved in this, reading about it. And most people thought that Nike was the official sponsor for the London Games, when they were not. So Adidas paid $100 million, I'm sure they got a lot out of it. And Nike got probably as much visibility just one week before the London Games. And everyone thinking that they were a sponsor. It was just a master act. And, and they probably spent no more than $5 million at the gym, even, even at that point. So those are just some innovative ways of basically being able to address this. So my message would be, you know, be open to change, never stop learning, reinvent yourself. I, I, I hit upon this uh, particular saying of Michael Jordan about three or four months ago. And I've, uh, wherever I've used it, I think it's generated a lot of interest. Most of you heard of Michael Jordan, basketball player? I would have used a better example in cricket, but at next time I'm fine. Uh, just read it, I'm sure you have. You know, in my opinion, uh, I follow cricket more than I follow basketball, but he's one of the biggest, best athletes. And he's not one of the best athletes just because of how good a basketball player he was, but how he inspired his team, basically, all his teammates, basically, to play well when he played well. My takeaway from what he says over here, if you look at it, is, you know, you can think about basically giving up at any point in time, and you have to be inspired by your failures. And, you know, people who are some of the best in their business, they fail more often than they succeed. And that is one of the things, you know, today about the U.S. that I believe is one of the strengths of the country. Little known strengths of the country, it's all about innovation. And it's all about entrepreneurship. And it's all about people taking risks. And the main difference between the U.S. and most other countries is you have a bad experience. In other places, you're considered a failure. There you basically cut your loss if you move on. And you are much smarter and you try the next thing. And what they don't do is basically continue to encourage something that is not going to be successful long term. And Michael Jordan's point is you got to keep trying, you're going to get better. And every time you fail, you learn something new, and you're going to be much better at it. And I think that, you know, I couldn't say it much better than this. Anyway, let me just uh, wrap up with a few things. And uh, these are just some examples uh, from my own career. They may or may not apply to you. They may not be the most interesting things. I'll just go through them pretty quickly and tell you a little bit about leadership. And I think leadership is quite different. Everyone can be a leader. You don't have to be the CEO of a company to be a leader. And I think the point here is that you can either choose to lead or you can choose to follow. And part of leadership, the first thing is anticipating events and outcomes before others do. So I'll share a quick story with you and then I come to this point. All of you know Sachin Tendulkar. So three months ago, he was in the US, and he was there uh, visiting on some business, and he was staying with a friend of mine, and this friend of mine was telling me the story. So he went to a New York Yankees baseball game. This is the most famous cricketer, arguably, right, in the history of the game, and never been to a baseball game. So he went to a baseball game. Most of you have seen baseball, right, at least on TV, you know what it's like. So uh, he went there, he sat in the audience, and my guess is he was probably 40, 50, 60 yards away from the pitcher who throws the ball. And so my friend was telling me the story. And uh, you know, when he, when in the US, they record the, the speed of the pitch. And I suppose there's a few elapsed seconds before you actually see the speed of the pitch. My friend was saying that Tendulkar basically was able to predict the speed of the ball sitting 30, 40, 50 yards away within a couple of miles. What it was. Think about it. someone who's never been to a baseball game, sitting in the audience, and, and able to predict that. Act. So my point is that he was one of the greatest batsmen because he anticipated things, you know, a mil millisecond before everyone else. Did. You know, when the ball left the bowler's hand, you know, the trajectory, the swing, etc. That's what it takes, and and that is the difference between people who are outstanding and 
people who are at risk. And, and so you've got to work on it, and anticipating events and outcomes before others do is very, very important. Most people spend their time today, the first thing they do in the office when they go is they check their emails, they respond to the emails, and then they have phone calls, they respond to the phone calls. And about 90% of those emails are highly unimportant. And, and you never spend, you never take 10 or 15 minutes to really think through about what you're doing and how you can make a difference. And how you can go do something that is going to up your game tomorrow versus today. And that's what that first point is. That you have to set aside, no matter what you do, you have to set aside some time to think about, you know, what are you going to do that's going to add exceptional value. But whatever it is. And the second point is finding extraordinary ways of doing ordinary things, right? I told you I have two children. I'm probably a little bit younger than you, maybe older than you, I don't know. But the point is, in your generation, people get impatient very quickly. And, you know, I have new people who come to work, and you give them something you think is pretty challenging, and in three and a half hours they're done. And then they're bothering you with what is happening, and, and you know, they're bored, and the next thing they want to go change their jobs and stuff like that. My point is, whether you work at Google, or whether you work at the most mundane places, Chances are you're doing 10 things. Six or seven of them are pretty mundane. Two or three of them are pretty exciting. And you have to look at it as a package, because you can't just focus. You know, life is not such that you're going to have an exciting thing to do every day. And you're evaluated based on how you do the package, how you deal with the package. And that's very important to be able to do extraordinary work with ordinary things. Because people essentially rely on you. You have to make yourself indisp indispensable early in life. You have to be a sought after person, no matter what you are. You have to be a person that you can be relied upon. You have to be a person that they can depend upon. And to be able to do that, you have to take care of the ordinary things, which don't excite you, and you have to take care of the extraordinary things, which excite you as well. And, <coughs> and then the last point is rising to the challenge when you find yourself least prepared. So I'll tell you a quick story. I was, uh, my office is in New York. I've lived in New York for the last 20 years. Uh, and this was 9-11, uh, year 2001. Our office was in Midtown Manhattan. If you've been to New York, the World Trade Center was right at the southern tip of Manhattan. And I was in the middle of Manhattan, and the World Trade Center, the, both of those towers are extremely tall, so you can see them from just about anywhere in Manhattan. And I had a direct view of that tower. I was on a um, conference call that morning uh, with a lot of people internationally. And uh, as, as you know, when the first plane hit, no one was sure what had happened. I saw smoke coming out of the tower. Most people say, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a small plane that uh, lost its way and collided into it. And as the call was going on, uh, I saw actually the second plane hit. Uh, and, and at that point, I knew that this is not anything normal. So I terminated the call. Uh, and then I just opened the door uh, to my uh, office uh, to just go outside. And there must have been about 20 or 30 people who were just waiting outside the, my office door, uh, waiting for me for the call to finish. And you know, this is the first time in probably most people's memory since Pearl Harbor that something like this had happened in Manhattan. And there were people who wanted to know if they should stay inside the building or leave. Some wanted to know how they could reach someone that they knew in the building, in the World Trade Center, and how they should go about doing it. Someone wanted to know whether uh, they'll have to stay here in the city for the next three days or they can get home. And I was about 30 seconds smart about what had happened. And I told myself that I cannot look concerned and I cannot look like, you know, I don't have the situation under control because they're counting on me. I didn't leave Manhattan for about three days. We had about 3,000 people we had to account for it. Some of them were at downtown where the planes had hit. But one of the things I said is I'm going to make sure I listen to people. And, and the second thing that I did was I got all of them busy in something. So we had about 3,000 people that we had to account for. 2001, everyone didn't have a cell phone. If you had a cell phone, you didn't know the number. So we just set up a phone bank and started calling people. And people got busy. And they were distracted. And we made it through the last couple of days. But nothing had trained me in life to go deal with something like that. And to me, that was an excellent learning experience. And I'm sure each of you will have an experience like that if you haven't known already. You just have to be prepared. Let me just get done with this. This is the last slide, I believe. Um, not waiting for an invitation. So I, I, I thought this, I shared this with a lot of our younger people in the context of their own career. And I, you know, the, the point I'm making here is that whatever you do in life is your career. 
and you have to be the one that has to take the initiative to shape it. No one is going to shape it for you. But what you have to remember is that a lot of people are willing to help you, but you have to be the initiator. And that's what it means, it's not waiting for an invitation. So a lot of times, I'm a consultant by background, and you know, sometimes you go visit a client that they tell you about what is the business problem, etc. You come back, you write a brief proposal, you submit it, and the client basically retains you and goes through the work. So if you are a young consultant and you're doing that, it's hard to be able to explain uh, you know what exactly is going to happen. You got to go find the facts. You got to maybe do the research and things like that. And if you do only, for instance, what I had said based on a six-hour interview, you're only going to basically accomplish so much. So you have to essentially advance the body of knowledge. You have to essentially look at this and say, okay, this is what I learned. And you always have to figure out how you leave your imprint on something. How are you going to add value? And that's the question that I mentioned earlier that you have to ask. And that's what I mean. Not waiting for an invitation. You just have to basically being able to being able to make sure that you can make it. Being able to relate individually and connect broadly. You know, if you think about it, there are, this is about leadership. A lot of people, they are very good either connecting with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, and others are very good at inspiring people in a large group. There are very few people who are good with both. And you have to figure out, being able to communicate effectively is very important to being a leader, no matter at what level. Because you can't get your point across, if you cannot debate, if you cannot be persuasive, it's very hard to have an impact and change behavior. And you have to figure out whether you are good communicating in a large group, and you've got to work on communicating in small groups, or you're good with the with the latter, and you have to work on the former. I think that's important. And and you know they say about Ronald Reagan and Winston Churchill, all the nice speeches that you've heard, one on one they were not as good, and they figured out a way to be able to deal with it. And I'm sure that's true of most. So that's, that's the point there, the, the second last. And the last point is expanding your, uh, your personal uh, experiences to enrich your professional performance. Um, the very simple point there is that, you know, people, so let me explain it a different way. Uh, many of you may be married, you have a family. If you're not, it probably is going to happen soon. So my guess is if you've come to Accelerator, you're pretty bright, you're pretty ambitious, and you're going to work pretty hard. So what happens is, you work hard, then you are guilty, you go home, you take care of things with your family, and you never take the time to basically develop your own interests. And, and I think it's very important to do that because the more you grow yourself and make yourself personally, the more interesting an individual you're going to be, and the more things you will have to share with others, and the more opportunities you have to build credibility with people and relationships. So whatever that is, it's not the same thing for every individual. You just have to go pursue it. One of the things that I have always wanted to do was to climb base camp in Mount Everest. Next year in October, I'm going to do that with four of my friends. It takes about two and a half weeks. It's not as difficult as it sounds. You have to be used to altitude and stuff like that. So whatever it is, whatever you enjoy doing, you know, if you like to sing, like, like golf, if you like to, you know, whatever it is. I think you have to do that because I think it's important to pursue your passion. I think if you do that, you end up being a better individual. Okay? So I bored you for about a half an hour, I think. And uh, let's uh, make this exciting. I'm going to, and I think that was the last slide, and it's Q&A. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about what I talked about, anything that you want to know that I didn't cover. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. Uh, if not, you can help me. Yes? Why don't you identify your name and uh, where are you from? Yes, sir, I'm Piyush. Uh, Piyush. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Jhansi. Uh, I've been here in this program. My question is, uh, you talked about Singularity University, and they have predicted that any career is going to be in the average of five years. So when you have that kind of scenario, and then you are running large corporations, then how do you, dis how do you plan out the long-term strategy of the company? I mean, because you are dealing with, for example, a company with 100,000 people. How do you deal with that kind of, those kind of issues and how do you ensure a continuity in the country, uh, in the company's operations? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, it's a good question. So the first important thing is to realize that you're being disrupted. You know, if you have a 100,000 person company, not the whole company is not going to get disrupted. There are pieces of it that are going to get disrupted. So if you're not spending time as a leadership group worrying about it, you're going to be caught basically off top. Okay? So I'll tell you, in my opinion, what happened with Kodak. Kodak is a pretty big company, right? Uh, 
Kodak in the 90s was uh, experiencing challenges with uh, essentially digital photography and uh, making inroads. This is the 90s. They got hold of someone who was with Motorola to come and lead Kodak. He was the CEO of Kodak for a relatively long period of time. And Motorola at that time, even today, is uh, one of the leading firms in terms of technology and stuff like that. And what they concluded was that these, you know how you guys have these Kodak films and then you go to a developer? There were so many Kodak film developers all over the world that they said there's no way that those guys are going to go out of business. And they never realized the impact, how quickly digital photography actually come in. So the point that the answer to your question is, first of all, you have to understand where you're getting disrupted. And, and then secondly, how to deal with it. And, and, and what happens is that uh, you, you, in, a, in a lot of cases, you cannot, you have to change your model when you're getting disrupted. So ultimately, you have to jettison a part of your business. And the mistake that a lot of companies do is that within their own organization, they start doing the same thing uh, to deal with the disruptive element of it. And the better answer is to create something that is separate, a standalone, that fights whatever the disruption is that you're dealing with while you're gradually trying to shrink this business, this part of the business that's being disrupted. So I don't know if you've heard of Blockbuster, for instance. It used to be basically a place that makes movies. And when digital streaming started, so they had these massive facilities all over the world, uh, uh, the country, so primarily in the US, you go there, drive in, rent a film, bring it, keep it for two, three days, whatever it is. If you keep it longer, you pay more for it, and then you go back and return. Well, so these guys are making a lot of money, and they said, why tell the uh, customer to return as soon? We make more money if it sits over there. But pretty soon they started realizing that we bring this thing, we don't use it, and if we're paying more money because we keep it longer, and digital streaming started, and essentially you could sit in your living room, buy something, you don't have to use it right away, and then you, you don't have to make a trip. And, 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 and so, so the point of that story is, the answer to your question is that there is no way Blockbuster was going to compete by keeping all of those stores the way it is. They needed to start, but they had the client, and if they had thought how to use those, that client to start a digital business, they could have basically slowed down the, uh, the, the demise of the existing business. But ultimately, they would have to go deeper. So there's no easy way to address it, and, and that's why certain industries, uh, you know, phase out, and that's okay. I went to Pittsburgh when I left uh, India 40 years ago uh, as a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon. Pittsburgh, actually, you'll find this interesting because it's a lot like Chicago. So within three miles of the downtown area, Johnson Lockman had a steel plant, and uh, so this is 1974, not that long ago. Today, if you go to Pittsburgh, it's the center of healthcare. It's the center of a lot of research. It's the center of a lot of different things. Totally, there's no steel that's produced. So you have to reinvent yourself. And the problem is that certain people are going to lose jobs. And they'll have to recruit themselves. So there isn't an easy answer. But you have to be prepared to exit. You have to have labor laws that are flexible. And you have to have people who can essentially you know, recruit themselves to take a job somewhere else. It's a good question. Someone has got to top that question for the better one. Point of that 
one of my example is, if you think about Canon, Nikon, your favorite uh, camera company, think about how big those equipments are today, right? You know, uh, a telephoto lens, a wide angle lens, right? A regular lens, it's basically eliminated all of those. And I predict that some of these companies that are making these cameras that cost anywhere from 500 to 1,000, 1,500 dollars, they are all going to be out of business. And they're going to be basically, first of all, it's not as bulky. And secondly, it's integrated with this. You don't have to worry about it. So but the point is that if I were Canon, if I were Nikon, I would have developed that before anyone else. And that's an example of a very good company that never figured it out. They didn't figure it out because there are three billion people around the world that have, that may not have smartphones, but there are at least a billion people or more who have smartphones today, can take pictures. And you think about how many people like to take pictures. That's the market. And that's what's going to happen. Cost less, less bulky, and it's easier to handle because it's stored. So those are the those are the uh, those are the adjacencies that you have to recognize and take advantage. Yes, you guys just let me know when you want to end it, okay? We don't make anything to provide services, right? Uh, what percentage of our revenue comes from services that we didn't offer five years ago? And we track that pretty rigorously. And it represents a steady 20 to 25 percent. Uh, so the service could be packaged differently, it could be delivered differently, and things like that. So that's a very important measure for us in terms of uh, being able to deal with the changing marketplace. And any time that percentage gets much lower than that, chances are that we are not being as leading as it. So, so that's a very important statistic for us. But the other thing, I mean, to put, make, it, put it, make it more tangible, so I mentioned cybersecurity earlier. Cybersecurity is not anything new. Cybersecurity problems existed 15 years ago. <laughs> Except today, it affects all of us. You know, Facebook account gets hacked, LinkedIn account gets hacked, the laptop at work gets hacked, stuff like that, and it happens all over the world, right? So we believe that for Deloitte, our cybersecurity business, which is no products, just consulting for companies, is going to be over a billion dollars in revenue. Today it's less than 200 million. And you can't find enough cybersecurity experts today to go be able to do that. So we'll have to learn from our own mistakes. We have to look, just be a little bit ahead of everyone else in terms of knowing about it. It's a boardroom topic. It's a technology topic. And the question is, how do you bridge it? Right? Because essentially you can bring the most complex of organizations to its needs if you, if you don't deal with this. So those are some of the ways that we deal with this. Very good training is important. You know, hiring bright people. The example that I use is, uh, you know, skill sets are something that you learn. Talent is something that you're born with, what you have between your years. So you've got to hire the best talent and you've got to give them the best set of experiences and best set of training and that's how you stay ahead of it. Other questions? Yes. So my name is Anupam. So my question is that, do uh, uh, you think that competition among the team is is building all the parts? Competition within the team, sir. Within the team? Within the team. Yeah. So uh, is it uh, nice to have competition within the team, or is it not? So? I think it's, uh, it's 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 nice to have competition within the team. I think competition will always exist. But here's what I would say to you. I think that you have to reach a point in life where I think you have to appreciate and recognize that the most important thing that's going to get you ahead is if you compete by your, with yourself. And so, you know, it's a little bit like golf. And we can, you can worry about what your partner is doing, but if you don't, basically your game doesn't fire up and make a difference in terms of our man. And so, so what I'm saying in the context of your question is that most of the time, 
people don't realize, but they are competing with themselves. Their own ability to be able to learn, their own ability to grasp, their own ability to change. And, and I think you have to come to grips with that much sooner uh, in life if you're going to continue to progress. Competition uh, always exists, it's human nature. Uh, I think a lot of it is how you deal with it. Uh, sometimes it's disruptive, and sometimes it depends on the individual who makes it worse. Uh, but you have to, as a leader, you have to also figure out middle ground to be able to advance what you're looking at. And, uh, you know, people, so I gave you the Michael Jordan example. In addition to being the best player, the reason why he's, there are a lot of other players who are pretty good in, in basketball, but the reason why he's remembered is, is that he basically worked a lot with his team to essentially come. And I'm sure that every bit is competitive with him and they were with anyone else. So you've got to figure out if you're a good person. Okay, maybe the last, yeah. Consulting market in the world is, uh, is the U.S. The second biggest consulting market in the world is Germany, right? And everyone believes, or has believed for the last 15 years, at least I can say since the year 2000, that China is going to be a very, very big consulting market. You know, there are 85 Chinese companies that are in the global Fortune 500. Ten years ago, there were 18 Chinese. Companies. So you would expect that it would be the biggest. Uh, a very big uh, consulting market. Today, it's very hard to make money in consulting in China because the rates haven't gone up to a level that. So here's the problem: it's not as hard to make money. To be able to bring the expertise that is needed from outside is expensive, and you are not able to get the billing rates here to Chinese companies. So everyone is investing. We are investing. We have been investing for the last six, seven years. But you cannot afford not to invest because things are going to turn around very quickly. Today, not many Chinese, as, as, as the second biggest economy, and as famous as China is, I bet most of you couldn't name more than three Chinese brands, okay, uh, globally. And in 10 years, that won't be the case. So when that happens, when that transition occurs, the rate per hour is going to change, things will get competitive, we're going to make money in consulting. So people are investing for the last 10 years. And what you have to do is you have to invest smartly. Uh, because if you don't have a presence in China, you can't serve Unity. You can't serve Johnson & Johnson because they have Chinese operations and stuff like that. So you don't have a choice. So that's why you have to look at a portfolio. You have to manage that portfolio. And, 
And like all good managers, you have to essentially work with the cycle, and you have to choose where you make this. I think that that's, that's perhaps the most important. OK, I will take one last question. I mean, I could go on, but I don't want to bore you. I'll take one last question if you have. You don't have to. So, you know, um, again, it's a good question. Uh, so I believe that the reason why the U.S. has been so successful and will continue to be successful, in my view, is primarily because of innovation. Okay? So that phone, you know, a lot of people would say that, well, it's made in China, and it probably costs $20 to manufacture. And if, if you just a fully loaded cost, then maybe the the, the marginal cost may be only ten dollars or so. But Apple is a trillion dollar company, not because the phone is made in China, it's because the intellectual property is in there. I think ultimately India, China will have to get involved and have ownership as it relates to innovation with a capital I as opposed to a small I. Okay. A lot of innovation occurs at the cold phase, so there's nothing wrong with it, I think. So some of it doesn't have to be revolutionary. But the place where you essentially draw very, very heavy margins is, is innovation in the technology areas. And, and that's where it can sustain itself for a very long period of time. Uh, one of the other things that you're talking about is intellectual property uh, uh, disruption and things like that. I think over time, that is going to go away uh, as the world becomes much more. I mean, there's still a lot of it, and it'll probably take the next five, six years or so, so it'll be a slow process. But the countries that are going to make a move, and I think India will be one of them, uh, over the next 10 years, 20 years, will be countries that basically get engaged in original forms of innovation. And the connection between university and business is very, very key in something like that. Uh, because a lot of the thinking occurs in universities, a lot of the application occurs in business. And the give and take is very important to have an innovation from it. I mean, if you think about it, I'm just using this iPhone example, because I, I can't get over it. I mean, think about it. Apple is a trillion dollar company. Think about it. If 15 years ago, if someone had told you that one company in the world is going to have a market cap of a trillion dollars, you would have said no way. Right? What is India's GDP? <laughs> so, Apple is almost India's GDP. Think of it. Country of 1.2 billion people. And, and why is it? I mean, when, when Steve Jobs made this phone, the only phones existed. There were smartphones. There were not that many smartphones, but um, Nokia had a smartphone. Blackberry existed. So this is as much about technology as it is understanding consumers and, and putting functionality in here, which disrupts a lot of other industries. So, you know, cars have uh, uh, GPS systems, right? So I'll give you an example. I was on a vacation with my family in Italy. And uh, you know, if you go into the rural areas of Italy, the roads are not marked very well. And the cars have GPS systems. And sometimes the GPS systems don't work very well. And they tell you to turn right or something like that, you don't see any roads. The Google map in this works 10 times better than a GPS system in a car. You don't see any road markings until you turn right and there'll be a dirt road there and you So this has disrupted basically what is a GPS system which you pay $600 as an option, an ordinary car. It doesn't matter, most people are not going to be using it. You know, I bet you that in the next five years or so, 10 years or so, no one will be using GPS systems in cars. It'll, it'll, it'll decorate the dashboard, but this will be much more. So, you know, it's that kind of thing basically that commands a lot of value and how you bring different applications in a simple way. Okay, thanks a lot for your time. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, sir. I think this was a great speech. Everybody is going to take something back from this, right? I got a couple of things from this. 
I think something that my father has often told me, one is not everything can be as fast as you like it and not everything can be as exciting as you want it. So you've got to take on and work on the whole package and that's how you make good things great. Thank you very much sir for taking the time out to come and speak to all of us. Uh, thank you Professor Singh for arranging this lovely talk. I ask now uh, Professor Singh to please come on the stage and uh, present sir with uh, the memento as token of our appreciation and thanks. So would you like to say a uh, one word? No, no, that will be disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, we'll just have a group photograph now with uh, all of us present here and then uh, some snacks I have. Yeah?